Uh, if there are questions and answers, we'll make them available um, in a document linked to our webinars page, which is where all of our courses and webinars are. And the materials and the, you know, the slides and the Q&A is going to be available on our FTP site as well, and that a compressed URL right there will take you to that material. So I'm going to turn this over to Evan. Thank you, Peter. Hello, everybody. It's nice to see we have a nice audience out there. So today I'm going to talk to you about PubChem as a source of laboratory chemical safety information. If you are not aware of what PubChem is as a resource, I'll just give you a, a quick overview. We're centered here at the National Center for Biotechnology Information, and we contain the uh, chemical uh, content that is found within NCBI within the resource called PubChem. This is our homepage. Uh, I'd encourage you to explore it, especially uh, the services tab at the top there, and uh, so that way you can have a greater familiarity with the resource. Our overall goal is to be an open archive of, of public information, and our, our key mission uh, has evolved slightly as a function of time, but what we really uh, aim to do is provide the biological role and function of chemical substances, and health and safety is definitely within that uh, scope. PubChem as a resource, the uh, contents change on a daily basis. Uh, so if the data's not there one day, uh, you can check back, you might find something the next. So the hope is that from this webinar, you'll be able to understand three primary things. That PubChem compound is a source of information for your laboratory chemical safety data. And the hope here is that you can understand the LCSS, the PubChem's Laboratory Chemical Safety Summary, uh, that its source and uh, content and where you can uh, access this information, but also how you can use uh, and access it relative to uh, laboratory safety prudent practices. There's quite a number of reasons for this uh, webinar to have uh, to be important for many people. For one, there are three hazmat responses to laboratories every week. Academic research laboratories account for about half of all hazmat responses to laboratories in the U.S. And teaching labs account for about 10%. Education is the third highest hazmat response sector. Since 2010, the Chemical Safety Board has produced two major reports on chemical safety incidents in research and teaching laboratory settings. These are based on a classroom methanol fire in 2006, and a series of research lab events from 2008 to 2011. There have been a, an ongoing series of laboratory hazmat events since then, and it's accumulated a, a rather uh, a history of chemical uh, accidents, which have really called into question the, the traditional laboratory health and safety paradigm of don't make mistakes and we won't have accidents into question, and led more to concern about the safety culture of laboratories. And this has been specifically addressed in reports by the ACS and National Research Council. So chemical health and safety data sources are really uh, blessed in many ways of having so many different data sources available. Uh, this, however, presents an issue in that there can be gaps or errors in information. If all the information was available, you know, will decisions made by chemists change? Now, every scientist you can think of, you know, they may not be aware of the various uh, sources of information. And I just presented here, you know, just a small uh, fraction of those that are available. Couple into this, the fact that laboratory chemical safety information is evolving. There's been a recent transition from material data to safety sheets, the so-called MSDS, to the globalized uh, Global Harmonization System G GHS Safety Data Sheets, otherwise known as SDS. And this was a really a major step forward in, in part because it provided a standardization of the information content that would be available. This has been uh, further evolving uh, through the National Research, uh, National Research Council, NRC's Prudent Practices in the Laboratory Handling and Management of Chemical Hazards publication. It was really a major step forward for laboratory chemical users and described issues of scale related to laboratory use of chemicals. It provided a, a set of, of properties and a format for uh, to be used, and the PubChem LCSS uh, has 
uh, more or less mirrored that content as a subset of information that is available within PubChem as a whole. It includes various types of hazard and safety information, such as flammability, tox uh, toxicity, exposure limits, exposure symptoms, first aid, handling, and cleanup. This evolution is important technically, but also culturally, because chemists have been traditionally disappointed by the limited value of the MSDS. So what this, you can imagine, is you know, the LCSS uh, enables all the available health and safety information, or a subset, uh, a useful subset of this, and making it available for ready use. One of the reasons why this is important relative to PubChem is that it provides a, a fair degree of breadth of information and really helps to move chemical safety information resources from the limitations of the 20th century paper media to leverage 21st century chemical information technologies. We go one step further than the traditional SDS that you might otherwise uh, get via GHS by including other information, such as specific reactivity information of the chemical with other reagents. So if you look at a, a typical property, such as a boiling point, you can then see who is providing what information from various authoritative resources. A common hazmat rule is that three sources have to agree on a property before an operational decision should be made based on that property. So with PubChem's collection of safety information, it allows for a direct comparison of authoritative data sources. You can access the LCSS in PubChem quite readily from any page that has this content. You'll see a, a safety summary link inside the page, which will then give you a, a laboratory chemical safety summary data view for that same record. But the content is reformatted in such a way that is more in line with the uh, GHS SDS uh, sheet, but also to make for easy comparisons of the information content. There's a fair bit of chemical safety data content inside PubChem. What you're looking at here is a data view from the PubChem classification browser, uh, where we're showing a classification tree for our PubChem compound table contents. So basically for the various information uh, pieces inside PubChem, you can see that we have over 100,000 records with safety and hazard information content. The numbers you see here are the number of chemical compound records inside PubChem that contain certain types of property or property types. So for instance, for GHS classifications, there are about 102,000 chemicals that have this type of information content. In addition, you can see that, or in contrast, stability and reactivity uh, information content is only limited to about 5,700 records. Most of this coming through the National Library of Medicine's Hazardous Substance Data Bank, HSDB, uh, system. So in terms of global harmonization, you might find that different data sources provide different degrees of, of GHS classification. Uh, nice thing here is that PubChem has provided the uh, subset of the GHS information content that's available. Perhaps important to this is the uh, information content that comes from the European Chemicals Agency through the uh, REACH uh, efforts that they have there in Europe. One thing that you'll notice is that PubChem records will aggregate the content. So if you see here for acetone, there's 78 different notifications provided by over 3,500 different companies. But you can see that when you compare this information content between the different sources, uh, some data sources, uh, such as that from the, the Japanese uh, NIGHT uh, data source, uh, includes additional GHS hazard codes that you don't find for other records. So in part by being able to compare these different data sources and then going back to the original data source to find out why perhaps that they have selected these different hazard codes, it can provide you more informed information uh, in, in terms of decisions. However, uh, there are some issues with some of uh, the information content that you can get through PubChem, in part because a chemical structure record could have multiple forms of an entity associated with it. As we see here in the case of formaldehyde, there are over 4,000 companies providing uh, different notifications, and we had to 
uh, provide a, a uh, uh, we aggregated this information content and let you know what percentage of these notifications that are coming from these companies or reporting various types of codes, hazard codes. They may correspond to different forms of the same entity that is of importance to your use case or may not be important to your use case. So you'd have to examine and, and see what are the different records and uh, types of information content that's available. A neat thing here is that PubChem opens up new opportunities for using safety data in a practical way by giving safety information in a very customized form via data streams. In fact, you can download the entire content. In this case, uh, you, you can go to the PubChem FTP site and you can download a gzip compressed XML file that has the entire content of what PubChem knows relative to S LCSS. And we update this on a daily basis. We also provide extensive provenance information where you can explore our different data sources and, for instance, limit them to annotation form, uh, sources. So out of the 522 data sources in PubChem today, there's 57 that provide annotation content. And you can examine each of these individual records. So, for instance, for the European Chemicals Agency, you can see that we, they provide us various types of information content, such as GHS classification information, and you can then download that content in a data stream that may be helpful and informative uh, for your purposes. You can also download this information content on the fly. The earlier PubChem table of contents also lists the information sources so that you can see how many chemical records have information from <clears throat> particular data sources. So in summary, the PubChem Laboratory Chemical Safety Summary contains basic information, raw data, GHS classifications, and more that are important for you to make informed choices or to locate information sources to make informed choices. It's also an important piece of the ongoing evolution of laboratory chemical safety information that helps you move away from uh, paper and more towards uh, a simple way for you as a human to read that content, uh, compare that content, um, and uh, to work with it in a, a computer readable way. In part because it's downloadable in bulk and we have quite a breadth of data, over 100,000 chemicals, but also a fair bit of depth for a number of entities which have an, uh, uh, other properties and, and information content that's important. It also provides an extensive provenance trail that allows you to understand which data sources that are uh, authoritative and how we do the data linking. So the work that you saw here today wasn't just uh, my work, it was from the various members of the PubChem group, uh, but also uh, in part due to our collaborators, especially a shout out to Leah McEwen and Ralph Stewart, but also our software uh, collaborators, uh, including NextMove Software, uh, Daniel Lowe and others, but also our, our PubChem data contributors and collaborators. This work was also supported in part by the Intramural Research Program here at NIH. And I've included uh, several different references here for uh, folks to get additional information about what was presented today. And I'd be happy to entertain any questions at this point in time. Thank you. Thanks, Evan. Uh, we do have one uh, question in the questions pod. It says, you mentioned that the LCSS collection is updated daily. Do you know how rapidly does GHS information change for a particular chemical? So in most cases, the LCSS information is not changing on a daily basis. However, mm -hmm. errors that people make in the LCSS uh, could be updated any time. It's having that update cycle, uh, but also the having the inclusion of content on a regular basis uh, allows us to keep up to date and uh, with other changes that are made throughout the information enterprise. But uh, as new information content is made available, it, it then gets added and then one can access that additional information content. Okay, we have another question. Um, in the aggregated data, for example, when there are 73 sources for the hazard codes, how do you delve into the 73 that were aggregated? In other words, how would you see the original uh, reports? So just to rephrase what, what I heard in, in terms of question, uh, can you access the original information content that was used to make up the LCSS inside PubChem? Uh, yes, you can go back to the original authoritative information data source, all the URLs that 
where the information content came from is available to you. In fact, when you start to see things that are different between different authoritative sources, uh, you should immediately uh, raise a red flag that you should go back and look at what they're talking about in terms of what aspect of that chemical or whether it could be a different phase of the material, um, gas versus solid versus liquid, or a mixture form of that in some cases. Another question, uh, if this is the evolution of the SDS, do you see LCSS becoming a standard for chemical reporting through suppliers? Well, I would say that suppliers oftentimes have a, a legal responsibility for the information content they provide. And uh, while LCSS uh, could become uh, part of the information data streams that you see from suppliers, uh, that legal requirement may um, provide some degree of separation as to what they want to report and why. Is there a version history tracking available? That is, can we know what information was available in December 2016 compared to today? No, not in the case of the uh, annotations provided to PubChem. If it was in the archival part of PubChem, the answer would be yes. However, annotations such as these are not archived. So you would have to go back to the original data source to see what information they provided or to regularly download and compare the LCSS content that is found within PubChem. Okay, here's one that will put you on the spot, but I think it's a good idea if you feel like doing it. Can you do a d demo to show them how to get to this on the web page? Sure. So you can just type in PubChem. In this case, I'm going to Google, and you can go directly to PubChem. You can search for a record. Oh, I don't know. Uh, what would be a good one? Acetone. It says a search within PubChem. You notice it finds a, a number of different data sources that are available. You can click on that record, and you can see that the laboratory chemical safety summary is, is right there. Uh, you can click on it and access what you see there. The neat thing is that you have a download button. You can always see the data used to display the page. You can download it in different well, formats. And you can learn how to get these to pull them for a set of structures just by looking at the URL that you see there. Uh, this information is in JSON format, which is not for humans to interpret, but for computers. So if you had a programmatic access route that you're interested in, you have access to both of these. If you wanted to go to PubChem, uh, you can go to the PubChem FTP site. You can go to the compound records in the extras folder and you can access the LCSS content directly right here. Hopefully I'm not making people too dizzy by moving around too quick. There's a classification tree inside uh, PubChem. You can go down to the PubChem compound table of contents and you can see the various information uh, that's available there. In fact, you can take a, a query that you had, uh, in this case I did acetone just a moment ago, I can pull that record in and it'll do one on the fly and we see of the, the various keyword searches of acetone, there were over 2,200 records, but over 1,400 of these have uh, some type of annotation content. Of these we can see that uh, there is safety and hazard information for 223, oops, moving around some of the elements of my screen here. We can figure out how many have uh, GHS content, and I'm going to just do a turn off records that don't have any information. We can see various types of information uh, that is helpful and useful uh, for our purposes. We see 216 have an LCSS data page. We can look for stability and reactivity content. So if we're interested in those that have uh, reactivities and incompatibilities, you can click on that. In this case, we can see which records have it. Uh, we have ethanol, methanol, various other types of records. A neat thing that may be worth exploring is that you can expand the table of contents and you can find other types of information that you may be interested, say you wanted to know about solubilities, or uh, in the case of reactivities and compatibilities, you can scroll to that section. I think I, I hit on a number of the things that were of interest. Um, I, I'd be happy to entertain any additional questions. There's another question in here that I, I don't know um, 
whether I understand it completely. We noted that when we download GHS from different sources, the file is the same. So EU regulations is the same as file as the Knight CMC. And he lists something here for um, one of the PubChem URLs. When you download information content by data source, you're downloading all data for that data stream for all sources. So you can filter that out dynamically because it's a computer accessible data stream. So you basically, uh, the download at this point is not based on data source. Uh, we could make it that way, but this is how it was designed at this point in time. Okay, I think we need to wrap it up. Um, we're about at time. If there are any questions that we didn't get to in the questions pod, we'll be sure to address those in the questions and answer document that's going to be posted uh, with the slides and everything else on the FTP site. And remember, that's going to be linked to the webinars and courses page. So thanks, everybody, for coming. Talk to you next time.